Fifty Shames of Earl Grey Chapter 1 I growl with frustration at my reflection in the mirror. My hair is fifty shades of messed up. Why is it so kinky and out of control? I need to stop sleeping with it wet. As I brush my long brown hair, the girl in the mirror, with brown eyes too big for her head, stares back at me. Wait, my eyes are blue. It dawns on me that I haven't been looking into the mirror. I've been staring at a poster of Kristen Stewart for five minutes. My own hair is fine. The situation I'm in, however, is still Fifty Shades of Messed Up. My roommate, Kathleen, has the brown bottle flu. What a bee. She was supposed to be the one interviewing this mega corporate beefcake for Boardroom Hotties magazine. Since she's too busy throwing up buckets of puke into the toilet, I've been volunteered to do her dirty work. The interview, not cleaning up her vomit. I am mere weeks away from graduating from college with a liberal arts bachelor's degree. Instead of studying for my final exams, though I am about to ride my bike, I'm about to ride my bike three and a half hours from Portland, Oregon to downtown Seattle to meet with Earl Grey, the fabulous, wealthy CEO of the Earl Grey Corporation. The interview can't be rescheduled, Kathleen says, because Mr. Grey's time is precious and oh so valuable, like mine isn't. As I said, my roommate is a total bee. Kathleen is sprawled out on the living room couch, watching 16 and pregnant. This wouldn't be so bad if she was my age and in school, but she's old enough to be my mom. If they ever do a show called Washed Up at 38, I'm sure she'll be the first cast. She's a staff writer for Boardroom Hotties, a gig she treats as her own rich asshole dating service. None of the corporate executives she has profiled have proposed to her, but she has made sandwiches with quite a few of them. You have to start somewhere, she always says. Why not with peanut butter jelly time? I don't know what's wrong with the good old American H.J., but then again, my experience with the opposite sex is almost non-existent. Kathleen looks up from her TV show and sees how annoyed I am with her. I'm sorry, Anna. It took me months to get this interview. Please do this for me. She begs me with her raspy Christian Bale as Batman voice. Somebody smoked too many cigarettes last night. Of course I'll do it. Kathleen, you need to rest. Do you need any NyQuil? Does it have alcohol in it? Yes, I say. Then pour a shot into a glass with some Red Bull, she says. And here, take my mini disc recorder and ask him these questions. I'll do the transcribing. I can't believe I'm doing this. I take the mini disc recorder and notebook from her and hop on my bicycle. It's only after I'm pedaling on the highway for half an hour that I remember her request for NyQuil and Red Bull. Oh well, that bee can get off her sick butt and mix her own drink. The Earl Grey Corporation headquarters in downtown Seattle is a ginormous 175-story office building that juts into the cloudless sky like a steel erection. I walk through the glass doors and into the lobby, which is floor-to-ceiling glass and steel. This fascinates me to no end, because buildings back in Portland are made of grass and mud. An attractive blonde behind the receptionist desk smiles at me as I walk in. I assume she's the receptionist because I can't think of any other reason she would be sitting behind the receptionist desk, unless she's filling in for the real receptionist, who could be on her lunch break. But then I remember, it's almost two, and I doubt anyone takes their lunch breaks that late, so this must be the actual receptionist. I'm here to see Mr. Gray, I say. My name is Anna Steele. I'm filling in for Kathleen Craven. Just a moment, Miss Steele, the receptionist says, checking her computer. I wish I had borrowed one of Kathleen's suit jackets for the interview. Standing here in this big building in front of the professionally dressed woman, I feel naked in my Tommy hoodie and Victoria's Secret sweatpants, with pink written across the arse. The sweatpants aren't pink, though. They're grey. This always confuses me when I put them on, because shouldn't they say grey on the backside? Maybe Victoria's secret is that she's colorblind. The receptionist glances up from her computer. Please sign in, Miss Steele, she says, pushing a clipboard with an attached pen across the desk to me. You want to take the elevator to the 90th floor. 
I stare at her blankly. We don't have elevators in Portland. This will be my first elevator ride. How do they work exactly? She smiles. The elevator car that you ride in is suspended in a shaft by a steel rope, which is looped around a groove pulley called a sheave. An electric motor rotates the sheave, raising and lowering the elevator car. That's fascinating, I say. Can I operate it myself? L is a very simple to operate. Once you're inside, you just have to press the button that says 90, she says, as I sign in. There's a hint of sarcasm in her voice, but I let it slide. They're probably not used to dealing with hicks from Portland around here. The receptionist hands me a security badge that reads Virgin. Is it that obvious? How did you know? That you're a first-time customer here at Earl Grey Corporation? Relax, she says, winking. I was just as nervous as you were the first time I met Earl Grey. I thank her and head towards the elevator. Two bold, muscular men dressed like secret service agents are standing guard, and one who looks exactly like Vin Diesel pushes up as I approach. Upon closer inspection, it is Vin Diesel. Whoa. I step in t into the elevator, push the button marked 90, and the magical box hurdles upwards towards Mr. Gray's office. It's like an amusement park ride, only it's free, and you don't have to stand in line for two hours. And no one's throwing up all over the floor. Which makes me think of Kathleen again. The elevator finally slows to a halt. The doors open, and I'm in another lobby, made of glass and steel. Is the whole building made up with the same materials? Where do they ever find so much glass and steel? I begin to do what I always do when I'm thinking. Pick my nose. Before I can shove my pinky in too far, another attractive blonde greets me. And pink guides me to a pleather beanbag chair. Wait here, Miss Steele, she says coolly. I sink down into the beanbag chair and watch the blonde leave down a hallway. Does Earl Grey employ any male receptionist? What a creep. I dig through my backpack and pull out Kathleen's notebook and glance over her questions. Who is this man I'm supposed to interview? This man whose last name is the name of the color of my sweatpants. Is that a sign? That me, Kathleen, didn't tell me anything about it, and I didn't think to ask. My brain is always going blank. This guy could be a hundred years old, or five. Although they wouldn't let a five-year-old run a company the size of Earl Grey Corporation, would they? Then I remember, they totally would. I saw it in the movie when I was little, Richie Rich, starring that cute boy from Home Alone. God, if I have to f interview an effing kid for the next hour... <laughs> I can't contain my nervous energy. My leg starts twitching. I'd rather be alone, curled up in a ball in my bed, crying myself to sleep. Anything but about to interview some five-year-old billionaire. Stop it, Anna, a voice says with a thick Jersey accent. It takes me a second to realize that it's my inner guidette. I can tell it's her, because when she talks inside my head, there's this weird echoey sound. There's no friggin' way he's five years old. Or a hundred. If he's being profiled in boardroom hotties, he's probably like every other CEO they lust for. Late 20s, early or 30s, with handsome and handsome in that geeky sort of way. I breathe a sigh of relief, because I know that my inner guide is probably right. The blonde returns. Miss Steele? Yes, I say, in a deeper voice than usual, trying to mask my crisis of confidence. Mr. Gray will see you in a few minutes. Would you like a refreshment while you wait? Coffee? Soda? Tea? Gravy, I say. It's supposed to be a joke, but the woman nods and heads back down the corridor. A minute later, she returns with a clear pint glass filled with thick brown gravy. Before I can ask for water, instead, the office door connected to the lobby swings open, and a handsome African-American gentleman exits. Jay-Z. Turning and pointing a finger back through the door, the rapper says, Nine holes this week. I assume he's talking about golf, but my mind starts to drift to thoughts of other holes. Jay-Z winks at me as he passes on his way to the elevator. My phone buzzes. It's a text message from Beyonce. He wanted me to keep my hands off the man. Whatever. Mr. Gray will see you now. The receptionist calls out to me from behind her desk. I pick up my backpack and notebook. 
check my hoodie pocket for the mini disc recorder. Still there. I leave the gravy and make my way slowly toward the open door. I should be back in Portland, studying for my finals, so that I can graduate. Yet, yeah, here I am, doing Kathleen's dirty work. I'm going to murder her, if Beals doesn't kill me first. I push the door open and trip over the hem of my sagging sweatpants. In one swift, clumsy motion, as I careen towards the floor, my body reflect reflexively reverts to gymnast mode. I drop the backpack and notebook, throw my arms out straight, and roll into a cartwheel. With momentum picked up from tripping, I complete three full cartwheels before landing on my feet on Mr. Gray's desk. I am so embarrassed about my clumsiness that I close my eyes. Wait, someone is clapping? I open my eyes and stare down at Mr. Gray. And holy mother effing sparkly vampires, is he hot.